All righty. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining once again. Um, this is a Common Futures Conversation webinar on priorities for COVID-19 recovery. Um, so the Common Futures Conversation is a flagship Chatham House project um, um, that brings together young people in Africa and Europe to have conversations on topics that matter to them, as well as also device solution. And this event is a culmination of a six week long discussion on priorities for COVID-19 recovery. Um, a big welcome to CFC community members, Chatham House members, and every other person joining us from Zoom or joining by Facebook Live. We're glad to have you. My name is Promise Lawal. I am a development and research professional and also a member of the Common Futures um, Conversations community. And I'll be your chair in today's event. All right, so the purpose of this um, event is for CFC community members to pitch their policy ideas and engage with policy makers and researchers on the topic of building back better as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. I'll read their bio and invite them up to give their opening remarks. So today we have three um, amazing speakers with us. We have um, Dexter Docetti. Dexter is a junior foresight analyst within the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's the OECD Secretary General's Office. He's a Canadian and Irish dual citizen who works to strengthen strategic foresight and long-term thinking across the OECD and governments around the world, as well as to bring a stronger future focus to global dialogue on key policy issues. Is the lead on the OECD's foresight for successful net zero strategies projects, which involves stress testing climate policy strategies against potential disruptions to ensure they're equipped to be robust and resilient across a range of possible futures. The aim is to challenge prevailing assumptions and stimulate ongoing dialogue on the most adaptive, adaptive policies for a rapidly evolving and uncertain world. Before joining the OECD, Dexter worked in the Government of Canada at Policy Horizons and the Department of Justice. Thank you, Dexter, for joining us. Our next speaker is Lara Allman. Lara Allman is a junior advisor at the German Corporation for International Collaboration, GIZ, where she advises the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development on One Health and Pandemic pre Prevention. In addition to subject areas, she also has an interest in global and One Health governance, health equity, and social determinants of health. Lara previously worked as a research analyst at Chatham House Global Health Program and at the Directorate General for European Civil Protection and Human Rights Aid Operations, DG ECHO, at the European Commission, where she focused on humanitarian and global health policy. Lara also serves as Chatham House's panel of young advisors. And finally, we have Johannes Wagner. Johannes Wagner was elected as a member of the German parliament in 2021 for the German Green Party as honorary member of the health committee and substitute member of the committee on development cooperation his work is mainly related to the topics of global health children's health as well as prevention and public health in general during his studies in medicine he was also a un youth delegate for sustainable development from 2016 to 2018. thank you once again to our speakers for making our time to join us this evening we're glad to have you um, before i hand over to the speakers let me just do some housekeeping for this this event. Um, please note that this meeting will be on the record and is being recorded. Um, is if you're not comfortable with your name, you can just mute your, your videos. Um, all attendees will be muted during the presentation, but you'll be able to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your question when we get to that time. So without um, further delay, I'm going to invite our speakers to share their initial remarks. And I'll be starting with Dexter. Dexter, you can mute yourself. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm Dexter. I'm, I, as, as mentioned in the bio, I, I work in the Strategic Foresight Unit within the Secretary General's Office of the OECD. So for those who don't know, the OECD is an international organization based in Paris with 38 member countries. Um, it's, its origin state back to the Marshall Plan and the recovery of Europe um, after the Second World War. And now it conducts a whole broad, a very broad range of analysis in economics and policy and development, um, things like PISA for education. So it's a very broad ranging international organization and think tank. 
Um, and so my work in that is a little bit special. I, uh, we, we work on, on bring long-term thinking, um, some systems thinking, systems approaches, and, and most notably the things here about preparation for disruption and preparing governments to be adaptable in the face of um, surprising changes. Our work's not about prediction, but more imagining and preparing for multiple possible futures and the challenges and opportunities that those might bring. This is the kind of work that saw a big uptick after COVID. Um, it's, you know, the, 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 the European Commission named a vice president in charge of um, foresight. The UN uh, listed foresight as one of its five uh, quintet of capabilities for the, the reimagining of that and the, the achievement of the, of the SDGs. Um, so a lot of the work I'm on now is about building future ready net zero transition strategies, but there's, and it's part of a horizontal project on building economic and climate resilience within the OECD. Uh, but there's some very strong links with the COVID recovery in that. And in both moments, you're gonna see all likely unprecedented levels of public investment and taxpayer dollars being spent. And so it's essential that these plans are ready to be resilient in the event of future disruptions like COVID. And that's where a lot of our work comes in, that things can't be completely derailed and that this is a very unique moment to build in, in the recovery from COVID and moving towards the climate agenda, a very unique moment to make some fairly transformational societal decisions. Um, I'm sure these things don't get derailed. Um, our, our core product is, is a, a toolkit, a foresight toolkit with 25 disruptions that could come up in the future. And our job is to explore those as individuals and the interactions between them. Some of the things on that list have very strong linkages to the conversations that happened during COVID. A lot of work on conspiracy theories and misinformation, which were a big problem during the COVID, have and are an ongoing problem during the COVID pandemic and maybe again. Um, and so our work is also about in the long-term building policy coherence and integration in, in those strategies, in uh, net zero strategies, but across everything as we mainstream climate and everything we do. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's more or less what I bring to the table here. I hope to bring some comments on some of the long-term implications for the, the people who are, who are raising cool ideas today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dexter. That sounds pretty interesting what you're doing at the OECD. Um, so Lara, please, you. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Good to be back at Chatham House. Um, I come from a GI, from GIZ where I advise our ministry on all things One Health and pandemic prevention, but I'm also a um, young advisor at Chatham House, so I'll be speaking as a sort of hybrid at the moment. And as we were asked to look at the trends, my immediate thought was, well, I no longer have to explain what I do for a living uh, to my parents, which pre-2020 was the entire, like, why did she study global health? So now that is the trend I've seen. I at least have a common sense with my parents. But as I was thinking about the recovery of COVID-19, I think what I focus on in my work is not immediately sh short-term solutions of opportunities that have been missed by young people, but actually making sure that in the long-term, young people, us, in the future, we will live here slightly longer than most people currently in power will not miss opportunities again because of a pandemic. So what I do is pandemic prevention, or at least I try. And so this is not the last pandemic. It isn't even over yet. So it's very ambitious to speak about recovery. Post COVID-19 is pre-disease X. So new pathogens have emerged more and more frequently in recent years and will continue to do so in the future. And most of those that you know, emerge or also that have caused pandemics are of zoonotic origin. That means that they've come from animals. So it is important that we don't forget about those health risks that still are out there and that are coming while we recover from the last one. We need to use this momentum and the current interest and understanding of my parents and other people what a pandemic is to use this peacetime to be better prepare, prepared to prevent the next pandemic. So how do we prevent a pandemic? So the emergence of new pathogens or the spread of existing ones into new geographies is intrinsically linked to the health of animals and to the health of, of environment. So how we do agriculture, where we live, how we build our cities, um, where we're moving to, how what we consume, both clothes, but also in terms of food, 
is all really important. One of my favorite examples of how, for example, climate change, which is the ultimate driver, um, impacts our health is malaria. If you look at Mount Kilimanjaro, the Anopheles mosquito that carries the malaria parasite likes a certain set of temperatures. As global temperature increases, so does the temperature on Mount Kilimanjaro. So it's getting warmer and warmer the higher you go up. With that increase in temperature, the mosquito that carries the parasite climbs up the mountain and exposes new populations that were previously not at risk of malaria to the parasite. And hence, they now can contract malaria. They might not have the access to care and are higher, well, not maybe higher risk, but they're at risk of dying of malaria. So if we then look at how do we solve this, there is the One Health approach that the German government advocates with this strategy paper, One Health, which is published a couple of years ago, which recognizes such interlinkages and aims through multisectoral collaboration to sustainably balance and optimize the health, not just of people, but also of, the, of animals and the environment to make sure we're all healthy together. Such efforts are, for example, also done at Chatham House. So that's what I did before. So it's exciting to link uh, the two. So what One Health really does, it is encourages us to contain a virus or other pathogen, um, not just once it reaches the humans, but act before that, right? Potentially, ideally, it prevented from emerging in the first place. That's incredibly ambitious, requires climate change action, tackling deforestation or similar, mm -hmm. but also containing it in the animal population and, or prevent a spillover in the, in the, into the human population. For that, we really need to strengthen veterinary services. So make sure that we not just support human health, but also animal health. So right now we can use this recovery phase to build those collaborations between sectors and equitable partnership, but also between countries. We learn from those countries where we see emerging new infectious diseases more frequently. Most of those are not high income countries and they have a valuable set of expertise that needs to be valued when we make global solutions for global problems. So once we have those collaborations set and goal, um, we can use them in times of crisis. Thank you, sorry. Thank you very much, Lara, thank you. Um, so I want Johannes to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much. And also I am very excited to be here at this event. Um, I'm yeah, uh, very happy to, to work again with CFC. I have uh, been in part of the, of the group who started is the CFC um, uh, project. And I'm very happy to join you now in my new role um, as a parliamentarian. But uh, in your questions, you were asking uh, you did ask also uh, for my experiences during my work, uh, within my work during the pandemic. And actually I was working as a doctor for the first two years of, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, I'm now also in the German Bundestag um, in the uh, working on health uh, projects and global health health projects. Uh, and in my area of work in the health sector in Germany, but I think in many countries in Europe, um, we have seen that the health sector itself got under economic pressure, that uh, we have uh, seen that certain um, protection gear wasn't in, uh, isn't produced anymore in Europe. Uh, it, and so we had a lack of protection gear. We had already before the pandemic, uh, very, very tight uh, personal resources. Uh, so we had a lack of doctors and nurses, which uh, due to the pandemic got even worse. Um, and this is now also my focus uh, and my experiences uh, uh, in my work now in, in the Bundestag, because we are seeing now, actually, I'm coming from a big debate today in the Bundestag about the vaccination, um, the mandatory vaccination. So the topics about health, uh, about uh, the pandemic are still ongoing. So yeah, it, the pandemic is not over yet, but my previous... Uh, uh, speaker, Mrs. Holvitt already said, so I agree absolutely with it. And we still have, have to have in mind that, that uh, yeah, while starting recovering from Corona, uh, it's, still, it's still happening. And uh, especially in, um, in, in countries where the, where the ratio of people who are vaccinated isn't that high as in, as in Germany. So one big thing is about the justice uh, of, of access to medicine uh, um, I, have, I want to work at in the future. And we have also have to focus on this topic while uh, tackling the recovery of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, 
and this is maybe yeah one one aspect but generally speaking is prevention is a very important thing we have to have in mind uh, in future i think uh, mrs Holfen mentioned many things uh, already in, in in this point so i will keep it very short to to hear from your ideas as well but um this is a major issue and also like in many countries uh, in the world but also in germany we had this problem that that the health sector isn't financed the way we want to see it financed and that um, people who were working on the front uh, did really had a really rough time for the last last two years as government uh, right now i mean the new coalition is, is governing since uh, half a year not, not even half a year uh, four months actually but as the german government before, before we did throughout the pandemic try to to support uh, economically the the, in the 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 industry in germany so that employment rates aren't going down um as much as they would if the government wouldn't have done those um, supports and we are focusing now um on what when we give those economical supports to certain industries on sustainability so the the slogan the green party uses a lot um is big bell is big um build back better so when we are now looking at uh, how we can recover from uh, the pandemic, we have always have in mind that the climate crisis is still ongoing and that we have to somehow unite uh, uh, the business and ecological aspects uh, um, because that's the only way to have a really sustainable recovery from, the, from this pandemic. Um, so while talking about every, every kind of... Okay, I think I... Yeah, I'm, one more I'm, minute. I'm done with my introduction. Yes, I'm sorry for speaking too long. No, no not a problem. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the topic of COVID is one that has affected everybody one way or the other, and the passion. Thank you very much, Lara, on talking about how we need to do and what we need to do to prevent it. And Your Honor, for letting us know the economic realities that are involved when trying to deal with COVID. All right, right now we are going to um going to invite the. Common Futures Conversation Committee members to present their policy ideas. Um, they would talk about their ideas for about three minutes, and after which we will um, have our speakers give their opinion, you know, and comment about the presentation. Um, that would be one minute per speaker. Please, in the interest of time, let's. We're doing pretty fine, just to be very honest. But you know, going forward, let's just try to keep your time so we can have enough time for questions from the audience, and we can, you know answer them um, accordingly. So right now I'll be inviting uh, Michelle Rotendo Man Mandiopera, my apologies, Michelle, from Zimbabwe to you know present our idea, a policy idea. Michelle? Uh, good day to you all. My name is Michelle uh, Rotendo Mandiopera. I'm from Zimbabwe. We get as Eden from those from Germany. Um, I will present my pol I'll be presenting my policy idea, which is uh, health screening. Um, I want to uh, touch base on some of the points that I want to raise here, which is what is health screening. A health screening is the process of identifying healthy people who may have an increased chance of a disease or a condition. The screening provider then offers information for the tests and treatment. This is to reduce associated problems or complications. Uh, we move to where is this coming from, which is the problem statement. Uh, one of the problems we felt, especially in Zimbabwe since COVID-19 started in March 2019, was that most people who died from COVID-19 had underlying conditions, which some knew and some had not known of. The world data confirms that underlying conditions are some of the causes of death in COVID-19 patients. Uh, some of the COVID-19 underlying co conditions which were linked to COVID-19 were hypertension, blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. Uh, with this, I believe the knowledge of disease is there at the end of the road rather than the start of the journey of life, which we can change that. I move on to the history of health screening, immunizations, and vaccinations. History through research has it we are safe, protected, and guaranteed immunity from screening, immunization, and vaccination. As we reach the World Immunization Week celebrated in the last week of April, which aims to highlight the collective action needed and to promote the use of vaccines to protect people of all ages against disease. Uh, the theme for this year is long life for all in pursuit of a long life well lived. 
I want to highlight now why it is important to all of us. It is imminent to take cloud screening at an advanced level because it helps in identifying if one is at risk or you have any condition or disease that you do not know about. Early detection of diseases result in better management and treatment of diseases, which decreases the risk of complications and increases the chances of better health outcomes. I would like to talk about the components of health screening. Uh, health screening has two components, which is the physical examination by a doctor and the social examination through health forums that campaigns for health talks and health checks. Um, I would like to highlight that government alone cannot handle health screening. There is need for a robust public-private partnership initiative or a memorandum of understanding where private entities can collaborate to the government or exercise social corporate responsibility and pool resources to help subsidize the cost of health screening. How can we be involved? Sure you have one more minute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Involvement would encompass creation of forums, websites, groups that encourage a global health citizen. We can be ambassadors and advocates of change. In terms of coverage, this has to be a global agenda in order for us to reach a global target. So then how do we start? We adopt the principle global health citizen as an agenda or forum or movement or foundation. We build it from there with much anticipation of reaching a target to promote health screening in the world. I thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was very brilliant. All right, so I will find the speakers to please give their input. One minute each in the order, Dexter, Lara, and Johannes. Well, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in public health, and I think the other two, two people on this panel, uh, panel are. I think this is a very impressive idea. I think there's a whole lot of good to this. Um, but I, I would actually just, I'm going to defer my time to the other two who know more about the subject matter on this. I think I have some ideas for the second and third presentation, perhaps, but not this one. Thank you, Dexter. Lara? Um, well, I can already say I love the idea. So, Dexter, you got the gist right. Um, um, I love the idea that um, I think in frames of framing your argument, really uh, use the impact of COVID because the true impact of COVID isn't known until decades when we actually know what you're trying to advocate for, the underlying conditions that are killing people in the future because they weren't diagnosed. Um, what I particularly liked is the public-private partnership aspect that you take. As critical as one can be, I think you're really tapping into the problem of that we need financing. And one of the ways to do it, at least in the beginning, is through collaborating with private sector. I think what you want to do there when you build it is make sure that in your memorandum of understanding, you have a strong privacy clause that those private sectors aren't able to use the data of the people because you hold some of the most valuable data when you hold the health data of your population um, against them in the long term, but do what you actually try and make the world a healthier place in the long term. So overall, I really liked it. Um, last thing, you know, access, affordability, availability, but you're securing all that with your public-private partnership and a global approach. So I'm very happy with your idea. Thank you, Lara. You on it? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for your for your pitch and yeah, very good idea. Actually, I would I was focusing on on the public private partnerships as well, but I'm not so optimistic as Lara because I think if we really, I mean, if the private sector gets involved, we have to really uh, ensure ensure that also like poor people got get those health checks, right? So once you involve uh, uh, the private sector maybe only rich people can get like the best care and so we have to ensure somehow that the government is involved and the government makes sure that everyone got get those health checks because you're absolutely right they are very crucial and we still uh, yeah have to have to focus on prevention in general but for everybody in germany we have seen that special very vulnerable groups suffered much more from corona and those vulnerable groups are very often groups um which are like um yeah living poor neighborhoods or like not in the in the best areas of a city so we have we had seen a very big interlinkage between uh, the social status and outcome or affection affection by by corona and i think um I'm not sure if the public private partnership is the best way to address those uh, those uh, issues but they can be at the beginning maybe a, a, a opportunity but in the end i think it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that everyone gets the best um, health um, mm -hmm. um yes so thank much from my side 
Thank you very much, everyone, for that input, great input. So um, please, if you have questions from the audience, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. At this moment, I will invite uh, Manfredi Morello from Italy to share its policy idea. Manfredi. Thank you very much, Promise. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, the idea I would like to propose and which the community has proposed is that remote education must not be lost. Now, the pandemic has taught us that remote education is actually an opportunity. It fostered accessibility. It gave us the idea, at least from the European side, that we are part of a really connected continent. Smart working, for instance, was in place well before the pandemic, and it simply flourished throughout the lockdown years 2020 and 2021 guaranteeing continuity both to companies and to people. It preserved somehow the fundamental right to work while namely boosting our technological capabilities as much as platforms user friendliness. But what about the right to study? Remote education has experienced a swift increase due to countries' lockdowns, but accessibility remains a problem to be faced some initiatives that proved that mobile tech is a feasible and affordable starting point and that connectivity could be framed as a fundamental right in the future. So if we applied these broad concepts to education, we might find out that connectivity fosters accessibility to education, that more education means more equality. So if I had in mind sort of list of policy solutions that could be uh, taken on the floor. The first one might be to finance through the next generation EU, a properly fund to let people scale up their skills, and so to provide unconnected areas residents with a connected device. This is a challenge I would foresee for the future. The second initiative that might be taken on the floor is a state cashback for people willing to return their second-hand mobile working devices, which then could be distributed for free to lower-income people, for example. So this initiative endorsing a cashback from the state to, to the people could be either come from private citizens and from corporates. In Italy, there is an example. Italy is the country I'm from. Uh, seeing that Italian companies had provided intensive care COVID patients with mobile technology to contact their relatives while it was impossible. So this is our final example of how accessibility and connectivity might decrease inequality and so favor remote education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manfredi. Thank you, that was awesome. So our speakers in the same audio, it's good to hear from you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I like this a lot. This is one that I do feel very qual qualified to think about, talk about, and engage with you on. Um, I, I think some of the, so excellent presentation. It's a good idea. I think you're moving in the right direction. I think preserving the opportunities that were seized during COVID would be great. I think the thing to raise, or a couple of things that I would like to raise. One, the quality, it's not just about losing it. It is, we have to get a lot better at this, right? I mean, Zoom has improved over the last couple of years, but the quality of digital education is not where it needs to be and it could be better. And I think the other part is this wasn't new to a lot of kids, right? Minecraft wasn't new. Kids were playing video games online all the time. And I think there's a lot to be learned in that. And this the, the one of the things, it's not just about access to devices because if they get access to devices, but it's only engaging in video games that aren't necessarily educational or skills building or TikTok. And you know, there's some good TikToks out there. I'm not gonna bash all of TikTok. But I think that there's a, a lot of thinking about how do you make sure that the educational education that's being provided here is engaging, that it's interesting, and that, and I think there is a lot of linkage here of like, what are the ways that you leverage gamification, not as an addiction or distraction, or we just want the most engagement, but how do you leverage this to build skills? Because the reach of video games like Fortnite outweighs almost, it does out, outdo anything in the education world. And so we need to be able to, to leverage some of those things. It's not necessarily, you know, that could be a fully public sector thing. It doesn't matter how you get there, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned in that space so that connectivity actually gets you to that final level of 
um, you know, higher quality skills building and accessibility to education. Thank you very much, Dexter. Lara? Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm slightly out of like a fish out of water in that one. But first of all, when I read it and when I heard it now, I love the sustainability aspect, connectivity, give or take, you know, encouraging citizens to return their use uh, technology um, is always a good thing in the way that we're currently doing. So do frame that argument in a sustainability way as well. Um, what I'm a bit cautious about with your idea is just my personal experience of interconnectivity in rural areas. Um, right now I'm in rural Germany and I do not even have cell phone service. So I think you might want to take a step back and ask not just connected devices, but also tackle the infrastructure in place. We need to have those devices connected because the best cell phones in the world aren't going to get you there. And lastly, you know, if it's ever going to happen, you need a follow up idea. Do also look at e-health. For example, in rural Australia, it's really common to have access to healthcare via, via the internet. So obviously that isn't solving all the issues, but it's securing that maybe your first appointment can be done from the comfort of your home and you don't have to travel very far. So I think that's a way where you can like build up on the idea that you already have. Thank you, Lara. Johannes? Yes, so I think Digitalization brings does does bring huge uh, opportunities. I mean, this meeting right now wouldn't be wouldn't be possible without uh, digital platforms. And uh, throughout Corona, we did see that that uh, populations uh, which uh, had a lot of technical, technical digital knowledge and digital um, um, yeah uh, infrastructure um, could use it for remote education and remote uh, learning, which was really helpful. Um, so I, I do in the, absolutely support your, your idea. Um, I want to point out that we have to ensure that everyone also is included because, I mean, you mentioned the, the issue of like access to also like uh, uh, the hardware, uh, having a good cell phone, having a, a laptop isn't uh, something that everyone has. In Germany, we have families with two, three, four kids and not everyone uh, does have a digital device um, so this is we have to ensure that as well and of course um, I think we have to general generally um, invest in education and of course one thing is is uh, digitalization but it's not the only way we have to invest in uh, I think the the personal contact also is very important and we should not uh, use it as the only way or um, for to 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 um, educate young people but of course it can be can be very, very helpful. And uh, we should absolutely um, increase uh, our investing investments in digitalization and especially in the area of education. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you. So once again, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be going over to our last um, CFC member will be preaching. Um, Kara, please over to you. Yeah, I will go straight to my proposed, uh, proposed po uh, policy, and it states that empowering formal and non-formal quality education policy on both e-learning and life skills to improve people's wealth, welfare. I'll give a brief introduction about it. With the introduction of computers, tablets, and mobile phones and internet in the 21st century, e-learning tools and delivery methods have expanded. This has enabled people access a wealth, a wealth of online and offline information and e-learning opportunities. E-learning ex exploits interactive technologies and communication systems to improve the learning experience. It has a potential to transform the way we, we teach and learn. On the other side, Life skills can contribute to self-awareness, critical thinking, decision-making, problem-solving, and effective communication that widens participation in lifelong learning. Still on this, it can enhance every learner to achieve his or her potential and help to build an education workforce empowered to change. This is a system for a future learning society. I would uh, further go to a uh, recommend to, to make to make to submit in my recommendations one global best design program a more professional global training is required for a good for a good draft and a competitive sustainable design program with the aim of effective implementation in communities 
Two, establishment of a school or a community network with a collective purpose of a community or a network is needed to help connectivity to schools, teachers, students, and other stakeholders nearby to provide the infrastructure of e-learning services, their maintenance and continuous development. Three, it would uh, strengthen digital and media literacy through supporting a national network of learning programs offering small grants, could also help in integrating digital and media literacy, even also uh, through partnering with media and technology companies into education initiatives, hosting communal, regional, or statewide learner public service announcement competitions. And finally, also to support conferences and educator so showcase competitions. Inclusion, that would be my, my first recommendation. Inclusion of special needs learners. There is an urgent need of more search on how to determine the technology that best, best supports disabled learners and the need to start doing a better job of training new teachers to serve all learners and the need to redesign teacher education programs. All learners should uh, be in position. Sorry, all learners think. should be in position to receive instructional adaptions, peer to, 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 to tutoring, cooperative learning. Uh, uh, least but not last, cooperation with universities and research centers. This would greatly help in developing digital resources as well as in-service and pre-service teacher education. This could as well help in developing a modern curriculum which can still be designed in guidance of delivering digital skills appropriately considering every level of education. Finally, using e-learning and life, life skills beyond schools. There is, this can be done both informal and formal in education, meaning that it does not limit anyone from attaining a specific skill. The community stakeholders like the parents, community leaders may wish to be part of the trainings and also gain access to new life skills that can be competitive globally. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kara. Thank you. So over to our speakers. Yeah. The input. So again, that was very exciting. Thank you for this. I, it's, there's a ton of opportunity in here to increase the accessibility of uh, education here. I, I really liked it, it you know, the, the amount of different layers that you worked into your policy development there on, on people with disabilities and things like that is fantastic. And I think you're right to see a fantastic opportunity here. So congrats on, on, on moving that in a really cool direction. Um, I actually, I wanted to link back to a comment Johannes made in the on the first presentation and a little bit on mine in the second. I think a lot of what I, what I said in the second would apply here, but um, when you're talking about involvement of media companies in this, I think there is a pretty major role to make sure that the incentives are aligned in, in terms of personal skills development and not in a situation where it's just a matter of securing attention and or uh, you know, money from people. Um, I think you wanna make sure that you're coming in, that there is long-term skills development as a priority and that that doesn't become a sort of corporate buzzword that gets thrown into these environments to, to soak up a lot of investment in states, but not really to have the long-term sustainable development of populations as a top priority. I think there is some tricky policy work there to make sure that that happens. That'll be the thing that I would, I would push you to develop in what is already a very good proposal. Thank you, Dexter. La? Hi, thanks so much for sharing your idea. Um, I also loved it and I do see links to Manfredi as well. So maybe there's a ways to collaborate those two ideas and build up on each other. Um, what I particularly liked is your focus on community, because what I've learned, at least from health programs, is if you don't have the community buy-in from your community leaders or also your parents, it's really hard to push for ideas at the ground level because they they aren't being done at the national level or regional level. So I do like that you acknowledge this and know where to start. Another um, thought I had when I, I listened is the concept of agile education that is often driven by student needs. So what I see in your idea is a huge potential from actually young people to create the programs that they want and they need in life skills and not just teachers to think about what young people might need because you're giving them the skills to do so, which I think is fantastic. And the last point I've had is I think on it before, internet is 
difficult to access at times that can be infrastructure wise, but also economically to just make sure that you might have a little back loop in it that makes sure that this, this is accessible to everybody. And I probably preempted some of the other comments there. Um, sorry. Thank you, Lara. Joanna. Thank you, uh, Curia, for your um, policy um, um, recommendation. I, I did like it as well um, a lot. And actually, Dexter and Lara did already um, summarize more or less what I wanted to say. I think um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in your, your approach. And having in mind those, those um, uh, restrictions Dexter was mentioning, uh, I think it can be really, really, really successful. Awesome. Thank you very much, Joanna. So I'm just going to go to the Q&A chat and see um, the questions that we have here. So we have one from Chiara Savanko. Uh, and we thank you for your pitch, my friendly. I agree that remote learning must be taken as an opportunity to increase connectivity. I wanted to ask you whether you have talked about how to tackle the adverse psychological effects that remote learning has been shown to have in students. There are a lot of studies documenting the worrying extent to which e-learning has increased youth anxiety, depression, aggressive behavior, and social detachment. How can we contrast this phenomenon while continuing to promote remote learning? That is, how do we promote a sustainable, socially constructive, and safe remote learning culture? That is a very interesting question. So I think I'll invite my friend to take a go at it, and then any of the panelists who wants to chip in on that. So thank you very much, uh, Promise, for giving me the floor. Uh, that's a very good point. Chiara, thank you very much. Um, the idea is that as we were thinking about how to use technology and digital, digitalization, sorry, for increasing remote education, we must also think about the right to disconnect. This is another fundamental right we should be thinking about. Uh, it, it, it relates to uh, remote working as much as remote education. Uh, I'm pretty aware of the points that were underlined in the, in the question here, and I'm quite confident that states and international organizations will find out a way to be living with progress, but to use it properly. So the uh, socially sustainable and safe and the, all the other points that were underlined here, I think they must be addressed by international organizations because actually they are delegated by the global citizens to be endorsing and addressing these challenges. So I think the states in the first place, but obviously they sit in international organizations, they should be giving answers. And then of course, it should be, um, it should be led to policymakers and to experts to address these kind of challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Manfredi. Before I go back to the speakers, Kara, do you wanna also pitch in a minute? since it's kind of similar to your idea? Yeah, uh, surely uh, about my idea, still it, it requires more of uh, trainings, just like I stated it in the, in the first place, that as a young person, I really need uh, to, to design a program that will guide me properly in implementation while I'm, I'm introducing the e-learning as well as the life skills. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank sure. you, Kara. So Dexter? Lara and Johannes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is obviously a pretty major issue there, although I'm a little bit of a skeptic on how much things like the digital world is the cause of, of depression and anxiety at, in, in these moments and not a whole lot of the other disconnection and failure to build community in effective ways. I think there were some ideas that were coming out of both presentations about how important it is to put community building, both in the physical world as well as online at the heart of this. I think if we design um, education systems around single learners and put them in a, an isolated silo as they're learning, that is gonna lead to a whole bunch of issues as opposed to really thinking about how you integrate group dynamics and communities and establish really healthy bonds and ideally not highly competitive bonds between people, but environments where children are and, and e-learners of all ages are encouraged to, you know, build deeper ties with people, have the kind of people that they can talk to about their anxieties and have the support systems around where they can work through some of the, those issues so that they don't end up getting much worse as we move into these systems. Um, All right, I, thank you, Laura. Um, 
I could come in with the other side. So I think those are all really valid examples for some of the populations, but actually remote education, just as remote working, also brings benefits. So in the moment where you do have a device and you do have internet, it makes it more agreeable, for example, for women that have more of the care burdens to actually take work from home because they don't have to travel or for neurodiverse people to actually follow discussions sometimes more easily, easier. Obviously, that depends on who you are as a person and how you like to study. But also, let's say you take a language or a course in English, but it isn't your first language, you're able to replay lectures or to make them more slowly. So those are also all benefits of remote learning or e-learning that you have um, that you don't have when your teacher is in front of you because you can't just yell at them and say, please repeat that and please speak more slowly or just please repeat the last 20 minutes because actually I just drifted off. So I think there's also benefits of remote learning that could counteract, well, not necessarily counteract, but also add to the benefit. All right, thank you, La. Johanna? So, I mean, very important point uh, mentioned by Chiara, I think it was her name, yes. Um, so. I think any of those um, ideas, um, if you focus too much on one idea alone, this won't uh, save everything or, or change everything. We have to we have to implement a number of intelligent policies at the same time. Uh, we have to um, yeah we have to invest in digitalization, but on the same hand um, same um, hand side we have to we have to uh, ensure that also there is. Um, yeah, community work done and, and people can interact with each other. So I think it's not focusing on one thing, but in general, I think we have a huge lack of investments in digitalization and e-learning and uh, remote uh, working, remote learning. And there's a lot of uh, yeah, big chances in this, uh, in this uh, sector, also for the health sector itself. I was working in the hospital uh, and I had so much time of my work was was uh, wasted by writing things by hand or sending sending the or calling people um, because we didn't know where free bed was. So I think in every uh, aspect, digitalization can help, but it's not the uh, only solution. Um, and so I think having those kind of um, um, points in mind when you talk about uh, big investments uh, is very important. All right, thank you very much. We have two more questions. Um, I don't know if probably would just write them together so we can you know, save time. We have one that says, um, COVID-19 has shown how vulnerable the education and health sector in developing countries are. What steps do you think can be taken to ensure that enough resources and support are injected into these sectors, even in the midst of non-proactiveness from leaders? That's the first question. And second question is that to the panelists now is, um, what issues are you most concerned about related to the pandemic? What issues are government not talking about enough? I don't know if you can just, you know, kind of address both together as the panelists uh, within the time we have left. So in that order, Dexter? Yeah, well, you're throwing me on the spot here. Um, I, uh, depends on who we're talking about when we say, um, non-preparative leaders, I, I think you're going to need leaders who are taking proactive action. I think that is the answer to this. I think you start building policies where people look at problems that are clearly on their way to happening. And, and so that's that's some of the work that Laura does. But I mean, even into to mine, like, let's start to think through some of the problems that could occur and start building preparedness strategies for some of those things and building plans for how to adapt all of the policies that we're designing into that. And so that that applies in education, right? Why hadn't we? Ha why wasn't there a fully developed plan of before COVID? How how you would deal with a situation where you couldn't have kids in classes? Um, and so for a whole lot of these things, you know, what, why weren't we thinking through? I think one of the biggest lessons out of COVID has been how fast we're able to change pretty major systems. Um, there was still a lot of problems on that, but. I think that there's a fair amount of range here for us to look into the future to articulate um, what we want our system to look like. And you know, I anticipate a little bit some of the difficulties that we could run into and, and just build contingency plans so that you can adapt to those kinds of things. Um, and I think it, it would be too, too long a list in terms of the issues that need to be prepared for. I think the reality is there's actually just so much low hanging fruit on these things, right? And you know, front and center on that is gonna be climate change. Like that's integrate plans to deal with climate disaster on that. 
there's a whole lot that remote education could do in terms of building climate resilience as well. You get you know, storm surges or, or heat waves where certain areas become uninhabitable for large periods of time. You need to be able to move large numbers of people without having their educational pathway massively disrupted. Thank you very much, Dexter Lara. Um, yeah, so I think I'd also love to hear Michelle on this, who clearly is an expert on the health sector uh, in her country. Um, well, I would focus on both in terms of what is most concerned and how can we tackle the lack of resources. So if we look at the One Health approach, I said it's more about really preventing it. And I see loads of the policy discussions currently taking place are more reacting to a pandemic once it's there, whereas, you know, preventing it would be a much cheaper and also costs less lives. And one thing about reacting is, you know, helping countries that are more prone to have diseases emerging that most likely are lower and middle income countries to strengthen their health systems, to strengthen their veterinary system and help them detect disease threats earlier and help them contain those threats earlier. And that sometimes maybe not politically sexy work, but it's really crucial and that would help if, um, help channel some of the resources that we have in higher income countries to really in equitable terms so not just throw them at it but actually ask what they need the money for um help strengthen or fill some of the gaps that we've seen in the health sectors in in all countries also in germany we need money for the health sector too as johannes mentioned um so i think that is one of the ways and what i'm concerned about is that we care about reaction and not prevention thank you lara Joanna. So um, as Lara just said, also, um, yeah, in Germany, we have to develop in many, many ways. And we also had a very vulnerable health sector when the, when the pandemic arrived uh, here. But of course, uh, certain resources do exist uh, yeah, much more here in, in Germany as in many other countries. So I think it's a special responsibility of uh, Europe, of Germany, to also help other people to yeah, invest in their health sectors. Right now, we have a new um, technique for vaccinations, and we have to uh, ensure that those knowledge, those techniques are transferred to other countries. So it's not only yeah, European companies, or factories uh, sending vaccinations to other countries, but other, also other countries are able and have the capacity to build Corona, but also other vaccinations and, and medication in, in general. Um, so the whole access issue is very, very important. And um, yeah, I think um, that's that's the most important thing for me in this in, in this discussion. But I'm also very interested in Michelle uh, and her opinion on this. Exactly. So Michelle, can you just chip in in the few minutes we have? What are your thoughts on that question? I'm um, sorry, before you go ahead, Michelle, um, Kara, there's a question um, in the chat box, if you can do so kind to reply and type um, what we have, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, you ahead, thank Michelle. you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it is very important uh, what you've been saying, all of you. Thank you so much for the ideas. Uh, apparently, it's very true that uh, there is need to invest more in health. Uh, in particular, when I look at Zimbabwe, uh, there is need to educate people, there is need for health talks, there is need for health campaigns, there is need for testimonials. Maybe before we even fork a lot of money, we need to educate people about health because it seems like people, most of the people are ignorant about health. Um, they become sick and some of them, they do not even know what the, 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 the diseases they have. They don't, they don't even have checkups. They don't even have screening. So I think apparently we need to invest in education. We need to invest in health talks and campaigns in testimonials so that people might be engaged in these discussions about health. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you everyone for your time. This has been a very, very, um, insightful moment one day oh we have one more question for Kira if you can just jump in in a minute um so the question says um how do you plan on mobilizing the community and keep them interested or even buying into e-learning so Kira if you okay, can just you. do this in one minute thank you so much uh now uh still I had, in, I had answered it but I will say it here that I've sampled it in the community where I work we happen to have been to have gotten a chance of uh, getting tablets that were donated, and this has helped kids to be at school and concentrate. And they take back the same information to the parents. I get the feedback from the parents. 
that how 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 they wish they could be part of the what of the of the of the e-learning. So there is need for a, a community center to probably to probably cater for e-learning and and life skills. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. It has been an amazing session. Thank you so much for our speakers, Dexter, Lara, Johannes, for hello. Thank you, everyone. This has been an amazing session. Thank you to our speakers, Dexter, Lara, Johannes, for your wonderful insights. Thank you to our CFC members who presented Michelle, um, Michelle Kira, and Manny Freddy. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us. We would like to let you know that the Common Futures Conversations Community um, is open applications for members. So you can follow us um, on Twitter at Common Futures CH to see more information or on Instagram at CH underscore common futures to learn more about how to join thank you very much for your time this has been an amazing session thank you to um chatham house and cfc for this platform i hope you learned something do enjoy the rest of your evening everyone